Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, terrific. Well, it's, it's lovely to be here, and um, we'll get started. Now, I understand that Chuck Nelson was, was here earlier. Yeah, yesterday. So probably a lot of the, you know, the, the brain science stuff has been covered and the, the ACE, the adversity stuff. So we're going to kind of just skip that part and kind of take a look then in a very, very simplistic way is this question, which I've been asked many times over the years, how are kids affected by armed conflict? And the answer, honestly, is it depends. So what does it depend on? And if you look at this particular uh, uh, graphic here, we do have kind of an, a, events and circumstances. So if you think about armed conflict, there's many, many kind of harmful, bad things that can happen, including uh, violence, sexual violence, displacement, hunger, and whatnot. And so those are the events. But I'm just going to move the mic um, up so we can hear a little bit better. OK. Is that better? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, but most of the time, events are mediated through what, what we call sort of the social ecologies of children. And over on that one, one thing, you'll see parents and families and extended families, teachers, peers. It's largely the human beings that are around children that will help mediate the effects of adversity. And if we kind of go back probably to something that Chuck talked about, would be there's this accumulation of risk. So how many bad things are happening to a child at the same time? And what the research says is most children can withstand one bad thing without any statistical uh, 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 results, so to speak, in, in terms of adverse adult outcomes. Two things, it gets a little iffy, but still most kids will navigate two bad things happening at the same time and turn out OK as adults. But when you put three to four bad things happening simultaneously, the likelihood, the statistical likelihood of bad adult outcomes goes up tremendously. And I think maybe Chuck talked about the adverse child experiences and whatnot. And that's a really good list to take a look at what are the kinds of adversities that cause harm. But then, so events often get mediated through children's relationships. And then we have to look at the developmental stage of a child. So kind of zero to five is what we'll be talking about today. Um, and here, we're really talking about a group of youngsters in which dependency is their, is their largest vulnerability. It's the largest risk. If you look at adolescence, for example, it's almost the opposite. When you're in a war zone, for example, and you're a teenage girl, let's just say you're listening to your family talking about bad things that are happening. Maybe there's sexual violence or a lot of people lost their lives. Or if you go into, say, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, situation, some of those families have the news on 24-7, which also can kind of be a secondary way of, of sort of traumatizing kids or whatnot. But it's they understand more you know, than babies do. And they're also exploited not because they can't do things, but because they can do things. They have capacities. So if you look at the phenomenon of child soldiers, it's largely the youth group that, that get, uh, get, get, get used as soldiers. Or if you're a female, uh, it's, you're, you're vulnerable because you are sexually uh, active or available or, 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 or whatnot. So, so we have to look at those developmental differences. And then depending on what happens, you know, we'll, we'll kind of produce the, the outcome, so to speak, either positive adjustment, resilience, or the, the, converse, uh, the reverse. Now, before moving on, I will say that there are some circumstances in which regardless of who's in a child's life are so overwhelming and so overbearing and so pernicious that they can have a direct impact, that there's nothing that a parent, for example, can do to mediate that because the circumstances are just uh, overwhelming in some ways. So like something like human torture, for example, is something that is just a life changer, so to speak. OK, so we're going to be talking about the zero to fives. And we're going to be talking about the biggest asset, which is staying with your parents or families, or the biggest risk, which is separation. Now, one of the things that I think we all should understand if we're going to work in this space is that separation is predictable. Um, and we've, I, I was part of a, a, a study with a historian and a human rights lawyer, and I was the child development person. And we look, say, historically at what has happened in different emergencies. Now, this is just a sample. So basically, in every major conflict, kids are separated. 
Uh, but if you look at, for example, World War II, there were 13 million children in Europe that were separated, and less than 40% ever got back to their original families. In the UK alone, there were 750,000 children that lived in urban centers and were evacuated to the countryside because of the bombing. Instead of going down into the tubes and staying with their parents, they were sent off to sort of temporary foster families in the countryside. And the, the results of that kind of ex, uh, experiment, if you want to use that, that language, and it was, we had some real illuminaries working in this space, Anna Freud and Sophie Dan and some of these early pioneers in, in psychology and psychiatry, basically deemed that it was more harmful for the kids to be evacuated and stay with strangers and go to different schools, et cetera, than it was for kids that stayed with their parents and had to go into the, the tubes when the bombings took place. If we look quickly at the Korean War, one of the things about this, before the, before the war started, I think there were two orphanages in all of kind of unified Korea. By the time it was finished, there was 53,000 orphanages. And it was 10 years after the end of the conflict that kids were still being uh, sent into these orphanages and being adopted internationally. In this country, Holt, I think it's Holt International out of Portland, Oregon, uh, sponsored tens of thousands of Korean babies and young children to be adopted by American families and whatnot. Now, in retrospect, when they looked at what, what was really happening, 80% of the children that went into orphanages had mothers and fathers around the corner that were poor. And the orphanages, in a certain sense, became a magnet. Uh, and it was big business. There were, at one point, you know, the president of South Korea and his wife owned some of these orphanages and were making large amounts of money by paying or getting paid by Holt, whatnot. So it's kind of a business in a certain sense, and it's not necessarily what was best for children or communities. Um, and again, I think these are some of the issues you need to look at. Mozambique, and then I'll move on. Um, when I went to Mozambique, um, you know, the International Committee, the Red Cross, claims to be the agency that does family tracing and reunification, for example. So after I don't know, seven years, I think it was, there was only 36 children that had been identified and reunited with their families. And what we understood was there was much more. We did assessments. We came up with about 150,000. And we were able to reunify about 75,000 kids within a matter of a few years because we used a different approach to tracing, sort of active tracing. IRC's model is you come into our office and tell us what happened. Well, kids don't do that. Our model was we're going to the communities, we're going to find where they are, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then we used, back in those days, we used uh, Polaroid cameras with the Instamatic things. So you, you got to take the picture of the child and making sure that it's, that it's visible and you get the biographical information. And, but then we had to turn it into posters, which that was the big uh, lag in time. And then we had to figure out ways of circulating the posters and whatnot to, to mothers and others. Uh, and, and whatnot. Today, they use facial recognition, for example, and, and, and you can kind of have children and, and separated children and parents talk to each other over the internet and whatnot, so technology has come in and played a significant role. What I'd like to do is, is, is fairly quickly go over just sort of a case study, and it goes back to 1994, post-genocide in Rwanda. Um, and in particular, the group of um, Hutu uh, individuals that ended up in uh, Goma Zaire, what's now the DRC. And there was somewhere around 800,000 to a million pe uh, whoops, excuse me, uh, Rwandese that were sort of trapped up in the very northern part of Rwanda. And they were kind of being held captive by the Hutu military. The military went to Goma. The political elite went to a place called Bukaba, which was down on the other side of Lake Kia. The French intervened and kind of liberated, because the, the RFA, the, the Kagame army was coming up and were, were about to sort of capture most of the soldiers. The French came in, created a pathway into Zaire, and it was horrific, because the people there were hungry, reed thin. They move across the border. They end up on lava rocks under a large uh, volcano. And they went down to Lake Kiev, and they drank the water, because they were thirsty and cholera broke out. I mean, they were immunologically naive. They had never been exposed to cholera before. And in the month of July, 
1994, 10,000 people were dying. So there was like June, July, August, numbers were huge. So the media gets involved, and you can see this caption, um, and it was horrific for sure. If we look here, so as everyone was sort of focused on the famine and the cholera and whatnot, there was sort of this crisis within a crisis, which were the children that were separated or, or, or unaccompanied. And this is what I'd like us to focus on a bit here. Now, if you take the, the, the handout, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. Um, if you haven't, would you take a quick look at it? It should be in the middle of the table. Okay. This was one of the early press releases around the phenomenon of separated children, unaccompanied children. And what I'd like you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is just take a look at this and talk to your neighbor. Uh, but what is it that you see? What is being emphasized here? What are the, what, what are the verbs? What are the nouns? How, is the how are the children being portrayed? How is the community, the refugee community, being portrayed? What about the external interveners? What, what, what are the messages here? Like what's up front and then what's kind of comes later uh, in, in this short press release? And we're gonna talk then about what you think might be the consequences of such a press release. Say it again, please. It's horrific to read. <laughs> horrific in what sense? In a, it's, um, I don't know. It's, it's just very uh, jarring. The so emotionally, it's a tough read? It's a tough okay. read. All right. Because, yeah. Okay. So it certainly got into your feelings. Where do those feelings direct you? Like, what if you read this, what, what might you think? What might you do? What might the consequences be? Say it again. White man's burden. White yeah. man's burden. So say a little bit more about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very familiar coming from coming from a country that became free 75 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, this is all. Yeah, it's it's just a a platform to pedestalize this Christian Clark uh, <laughs> and uh, lack of agency. They crave attention. Um, you know, dehumanization. Um, the story, I mean, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, it's just horrible. horrible. Even by like PR standards, this is quite, <laughs> quite crappy. Um, also like we've never hard. seen such a huge number of people moving in such a short, it's almost like this is the guy who's traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> the cheerful Canadian, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, please. like I don't know I might be wrong but okay. uh, I thought like considering such reading such I don't know breathtaking uh, situation yeah. uh, the yeah. word cheerful Canadian okay. AIDS I so the aid like the, the, the outside aid person is cheerful but the kids are a bit on the pathetic side there's no agency as our as our colleague over here said the community itself is is basically rendered inept or incapable of taking care of its children uh, and there's a big focus on the physical health, saving lives, but not necessarily on the psychological health of, of kids. Okay, yes. Oh, I just, um, there's a lot of language that sort of um, massifies the group, which uh, I understand there are a lot of people in a, in a small space, but, um, and the whole Pied Piper is so jarring uh, it, you know there are contexts that are so dire that you don't need a metaphor okay. <laughs> excellent excellent <laughs> you guys are better critiquers than, than than i was at the time um yes last one thank you finding the solution to the local community and there there is no responsibility for the international community because they said that 
we're counting on the African sense of community adoption isn't the solution, neither our orphanage. So uh, the, the easiest way is just to put them back to their families, whatever that means. And I think that this is irresponsible uh, okay. act. Okay. So there is some language that towards the end, which is we're counting on the African unity, which is a bit of a gross stereotype, but, but maybe headed in the right direction. And orphanages aren't the solution, but what are they doing? They're putting kids in, in the orphanages. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think um, it, uh, it gives us a, you know, a, a good description of what, it, what is happening. But then the, the problem is there is a lot of glorifying you know, the aid worker. Yes. Who, who is not uh, the, 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 the main point of the story. Yeah, that's excellent. All right, so let's take a look at then kind of what, what happened as, a, as partially at least a result of this article which had huge coverage within the context of this larger crisis. Lots of people dying for several months. Um, Europe in particular discovers the orphans. And I was there, I think I was there starting in July 1994. And the, the flood of agency individuals coming from the UK and, and, and continental Europe was massive. And they came with money in hand, having never done an assessment, money to set up orphanages. And we ended up with um, a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of orphanages. And the, the irony of, of all this is an attempt to save lives and underestimate the assets that were in the community, as dire as things were, we ended up with this, which I'm not sure it's readable, but this was, this was um, actually an epidemiologist who uh, taught up at the School of Public Health here at the time worked for CDC and was seconded to UNHCR. I think it was, was the, uh, Les Roberts was the, uh, was the pathway. And he's one of these guys that runs around and, and counts deaths. He, he you know, runs around and tries to find as much information as possible and then puts those sort of in the boxes of WHO and the NGOs and whatnot to help inform what is taking place in terms of mortality. And if you look at, if you can read the first one, I'm not sure I can read it. So that's Caritas. And if you look at the, um, so the deaths per 10,000 were, the rate was 75, we're in a sort of a, a, a a healthy or normal African community would be more like five per 10,000. It had jumped up to 75. And what Dr. Roberts points out is the death rates inside these orphanages, were, which were essentially, you know, UNHCR classic blue sheeting, dirt floors, cots, and whatnot, uh, was higher in these orphanages than it was out in the camp itself. So, a personal story, the first time I went to the Car Caritas Orphanage, there were 21 babies. So they got the babies, the little ones, and they were laid out on these army cots. So there was like one child per cot with IVs in his or her arm. So the, the micronutrient thing was being addressed, but nobody picked them up. Nobody held them. And I remember when I was asking one of the sisters, what, you know, I, I, won't, I won't repeat my language, but you know, what, what, the, what the heck is going on here? She said, well, we can't do that piece until we train people. Now tell me what Rwandese woman needs to be trained to hold a baby. I mean, it was, it was insanity. And I remember there was a, um, I think he was about six month old boy that was kind of withering away. And I remember picking him up and just looking in his eyes and those of you that are parents, do you remember when your baby was about three or four months and she, you're looking at her, in her face and she's looking in your face and she smiles, she recognizes you? It was the total opposite. He had checked out. He was on his way towards death and in fact did die, but was still physically alive, but no one picked him up. And it, it, it's called, fail so that's the worst outcome, failure to thrive in some ways. Um, so what, what is the, uh, does anyone remember the actual story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what is it? What, did, what happened with the Pied Piper of Hamlin? Can you just tell us the quick story? Well, I think, I think he 
gets rid of the rats yes. in the community. Yes. And the bubonic plague was. Right. Yeah. And he, they're supposed to pay him. Yeah. And they don't pay him. Yeah. So he says, I'm going to take your children. So he does. And he plays the, the flute. flute and leads all the children away. And that's the end. So that's the other reason that's a very strange image to choose for that press release on many levels. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that essentially mirrored what happened in this case. Outside interveners intervening in a particular way based perhaps on sympathy rather than empathy. Uh, perhaps it was the white man burden, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it clearly puts the relief workers and their agencies in front and center and under, under, underestimates the resilience or potential resilience within the communities. So we're going to move on here in just a minute, but then we had to figure out, that was my job, figure out how, how, to, how to stop this. And so I was sitting out in front of one of the orphanages that had a, a, a table, uh, and it was sort of like a little, I think she was 13-year-old uh, refugee girl came up and basically was telling them, I don't have any parents, I need to go inside. You know, and you, if you put food inside of four walls and say the only kids that get the food have to be without their parents, guess, again, guess what happens in terms of, it's a, it's a magnet in some way. So we were listening to this young girl and then we went out and just said, okay, well, where did you come from? And she kind of points over there. And who, who is that over there? Well, that's my auntie. Uh, so we went back and talked to the auntie and it's like, how come she's not, how come she's coming here? And it's, it's like, we don't have food, we don't have a blanket. She's better off there. Well, if we brought the food and blanket to you, would you keep her? And she goes, oh, of course we would. So that's how we try to fig figure out how to stop this. And we ended up being able to stop nine out of 10 kids from coming in. So again, the assets are in the community. They're not necessarily in the hands, so to speak, or the minds of the relief workers. And I think that's just an important thing to understand because many journalists will go in and they'll talk to UNICEF or Save the Children to get your your story, and they'll give you their story, but is that the story? Is that the story that we should be reporting on? All right, last, last slide on this. So what are the consequences? 1995, about a year later, we found out that 80% of the children in orphanages had relatives in, the, in, in refugee camps. Again, the magnet effect. 56 million spent over four years undoing these mistakes. That's a lot of money that could have gone to someplace else. Orphanages were costly. The government of Rwanda was absolutely pissed at the uh, international community for putting so many kids in orphanages that were, they were then expected to pay for. So the cost of orphanages versus foster care, you can, you can see that. Um, so lots were learned uh, in, in, in this context. I, I hate to say it, but similar mistakes are also being made. And maybe part of what journalism, good journalism could do would be to begin to unearth these misconceptions in some ways. Okay, let's just quickly switch to modern times. So there are more children displaced from Ukraine than ever since World War II. So there's massive, as you know, massive displacement into, into, into Poland and elsewhere. But we're gonna focus on those subset of kids that were taken into Russia. So one of the things, I, I worked a bit with the Human Rights Commission looking at uh, the, the ramifications of all this stuff. And the conclusion is that what Russia did is a war crime. So part of a story could be on the violation of international norms and human rights and G Geneva Conventions, et cetera, et cetera. That's an interesting story. Another story is compared to like what I mentioned in Mozambique where we had to use Polaroid cameras, we now have like there's 60 sort of high-tech detectives that the UN brought in to use facial recognition to try to find out where these kids are. That's, that's kind of what tracing has kind of come, 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 come into now. How do we search for kids? And we can do it in different uh, ways. So the tech thing is an interesting story. But now we get into more complicated things which might be somewhat counterintuitive in some ways. Um, if we look at what could be referred to as a child's sense of time. Now again, we're talking about children between birth and five years old. Let's say a three-year-old girl was taken from her family illegally, a war crime, put with a Russian family, and she's been with that Russian family for three years. Who is her parents? 
It's like the biological parents versus the psychological parents. Because kids, because they're dependent, they have to grab onto a human being in order to survive and thrive. And when you do that, as you know, you kind of build uh, attachments. And it's the multiplicity of bad things. So they've been separated from their biological families. Are we now going to separate them again from their psychological family? So that's kind of a child lens in some ways. But what about the biological parents? They have legal rights to the kids. What about kids that were in orphanages in the Ukraine, whoops, and now they're in foster families in, in, in Russia? Should they be sent back? And if so, where did they go in some ways? So these are some of the more thorny issues that kind of beneath the surface, I think we at least have to be aware of. Um, I put this in here because, you know, if, if you follow anything in this country, there's, there's lots and lots of uh, controversy around our southern border. And we normally think about people coming into the United States, coming from Central America and whatnot. But during periods of time after the Ukrainian conflict, the Ukrainians were the highest number of people being stopped at entry points. And in some cases, kids were separated from the adults they arrived with at those entry points. So again, the interveners making things a bit worse. OK, now we get into all the complexities of the Israeli and uh, Palestinian uh, conflict. And here are you know, some, some verbiage that came out of uh, uh, the press in November two, uh, 2023. So you see that according to the government, there's 40 of the hostages are children, including a 10-month-old baby and preschoolers, some of whom saw their relatives murdered before their eyes, et cetera, et cetera. We then have a psychologist saying it, it will never be full recovery. It would never be that. Whatever happened to them would not affect them or be forgotten. So a little bit of a projection as to how kids are going to turn out, perhaps based on a clinical perspective. So kids that went through this, I have no doubt that their mental and emotional landscape will never be the same. But are we erasing the possibility of resilience? And if we think about where resilience comes, it comes from other human beings that care for kids uh, and whatnot. So I, I just would caution us as we're looking at things like trauma to let's not write these kids off. The second thing, in, in real life, it's complex. They have post-trauma. We really need to be supportive and patient for the long run. So this uh, expert, psychologist, is talking about the process of recovery, not the outcome in some ways. And so I just, again, I just sort of draw that, that distinction. Um, uh, and you know, one of the things that Hamas did to these children when they were hostages is they told them, your parents abandoned you. They don't care about you. Now, why would they do that? Is that a form of psychological torture? Is it? It's pretty pernicious, however you want to sort of label it uh, and, 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 and whatnot. But, it, but again, kids can be used for political purposes. Um, and as horrific as this is, I, for one, wouldn't necessarily predict that they're all doomed. There's, they're not going to be a lost generation. They're going to be a different generation. If we go to the other side, so here's from Al Jazeera. At least 19,000 children in Gaza Strip have been left unaccompanied or separated from their families. The UN is calling for a ceasefire so we can find out actually where these kids are, who they're with, et cetera, et cetera. NPR, Gaza's uh, war's youngest evacu ev evacuees reached safety in Egypt, many without parents. I think there were 38 babies that were kind of in incubators that were sent into, into Egypt. But our friend from WHO, what is she saying? What is she, what is she putting forward as kind of the most important issue? And what perhaps is not being discussed? Can you see it? Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. One of the things that um, I think health professionals in particular need to understand is there's more than the physical bodies of y young children. Like if you think about stunting, for example, it's not only small bodies, but it's small brains. And if we think about, go back to Chuck Nelson's talk, I'm sure he got into this stuff, but how do you build healthy brains? It's a combination of responsive social care, parenting, the so-called serve and return, baby cries, she's picked up. That actually becomes part of her biology through the genetic um, uh, uh, process that turns certain uh, genes and organs on and off in some way. So actually, your love and affection becomes part of your children's biology in real time, not just genetic passing them on, but environment change is biology in some ways. So we're, they're not accustomed to thinking beyond the physical health issue. And that is critical, but it's insufficient as we learned in GOMA, for example. Um, the other thing here is how do they know there's no parents? And how do they know there's not like extended family members? in some ways. Was there any pre-planning uh, taken into account in terms of, well, what happens if these kids go to Egypt and they are, that, you know, they sort of recover physically, nutritionally and whatnot, then what? And again, these are just short clips, but, but these are some of the things I think we really need to kind of be asking, uh, you know, some of, some of these questions. If we're looking at this from sort of a child development lens, okay. Oh, I think also what reality they've told the kids as to what's happening. You know, are they being very explicit or is it trying to protect them in a certain way from future psychological harm, especially if their parents are perhaps alive or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good points. The general rule or the, or the principles, the interagency agreements is if, if you have to evacu evacuate children, which is a big if, if you look at what's happened historically with kids that have been evacuated. Most of them don't go home, for example, uh, or many don't go home. Uh, but if you're going to do it, you're supposed to do it with a relative. If there's brothers and sisters, you've got to keep them together. If there's parents, aunties, uncles, they should go too. Sending a child off by herself is not good practice. Now, I can't, I can't argue with this situation um, because it's, it's pretty dire. Um, but I just would ask questions. If you're investigating something like this, what are the questions you want to ask beyond sort of saving physical lives? Okay. Yes? It's related to the uh, health organization and other organization and in general, the media, that they flat numbers. Uh, the, the the values, the, the statistics, the numbers, they devalue the experience of the sufferer. For example, the 19,000 children, which is in a very short term or a very short time, and this should be considered, how many of them, they lost the whole family. Right. This is different. So there are levels. There are multi-layer for each crisis. So yeah. when we said that, 20,000, uh, I'm not underestimating the sufferings of anyone, but when we said that 20,000 of the Ukrainian children, what are the conditions for them? Are they, they have the same situation? The 19,000, how many of them? They lost both parents, how many? They lost the whole family, the aunt, the uncle, everyone. So I think that flattening numbers by only giving the total numbers, there are also, uh, something should be addressed. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Again, I think these are estimates. Um, I don't think anyone knows whether there's 19, 15, 25,000 kids. And I don't, I don't think your point is very well taken, but we don't know whether or not all the family members were killed in some ways. Um, and, and that's partly why um, you know, an assessment in this case would be a, would be a good thing to tr actually try to figure out what, what are the long-term plans. All right, I'm Neil, gonna be quiet. I, oh, go ahead, please. I, I just wanna just, while we're talking about um, sort of the narratives and how journalists may be furthering narratives that are not helpful, 
where would you suggest that they get, journalists get the right story? Because I would assume that WHO would be the place or many of the aid organizations that of course have their own agenda. So what, you know, where, where do we figure out what the real story is? Well, no, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and I'm, I'm not in any way suggesting in this case that WHO is, is um, sort of horribly off the mark here. I'm just sort of pointing out what's not being said. I think that's, I think, I think international organizations, for example, are UN are legitimate entities to talk to, but it's a sliver of the story. And it's not the whole story. And I think the GOMA example, that, that article was based on essentially a couple of interviews with, with UNICEF. But did, did anyone go further than that? I think the true story, true is not, that's not the right word. I think one of the constituencies that one really needs to tap into are the people themselves. And what, what are they doing in terms of preventing separation, in terms of reunification uh, and, and whatnot, and not just depending totally on the external actors, which will give you their agency perspective, perhaps ahead of the community perspective, or give lip service to communities are resilient, but are there, are there interventions building on that resilience, or are they facts sort of um, creating some sort of dependency, you know, in, 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 in some ways. So this is more, for me, it's, I mean, I've worked with the UN and other organizations, so it's more of a lover's quarrel than it is a, a divorce, so to speak. Um, but, but I think we all need to be a little bit critical, not in a nasty way, but just asking critical questions is, is part of the, uh, and, part and, of the um, Go Neil, ahead. Oh, is this your last um, slide? And then, we'll st then yes, we can open it up for slide. questions. Great. So this is yeah. just, just some resources that are, I'm sure Chuck Nelson gave you a lot of really good stuff on kind of brain health and whatnot. So this is more from a international community perspective, some of the things that might inform articles. So the first thing is, again, the, the book that I mentioned, which kind of ended up being the cornerstone study on separated unaccompanied children. There's interagency standing committee guidelines. This is what all the external actors agree to. There's the uh, early childhood development resource collection out of INEE. All this stuff is on the web, I think. And then evacuation of children from conflict, something that UNICEF and UNHCR agreed to. And this was also authored by Everett, Everett Ressler. Just, just a few sources that might be useful if you find yourself in a situation where uh, you're focused on these issues. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> so let's, um, just, uh, All right, we have about a half hour um, for questions, and I'm I'm just going to. Um, well, I just asked you one one question that I think is very helpful, which is, um, I mean, your answer was very quite helpful. You know, how do, how do you reach? The right story, or or the what is actually affecting people on the ground. Um, I guess just to follow up on that, how would you do that in a war situation? Again, some some journalists here do cover um, stories in war zones. Others are more um, distant. You know, we're covering the war from our desks in the United States. So, who should we be calling? other than you, <laughs> although perhaps we should also. Um, you know, what kind of guidance can you give journalists who want to get this story right and we just don't always have the background to know what to believe and what not to believe? Yeah, so that's a great question, but I'm, I'm gonna turn the question over to one of you if, if you wouldn't mind. Have, has anyone in this room actually been in a war situation covering, covering kids? So who, who did you go to for sources of information? Okay. I work with locals. I trust them. We train local reporters. We work with, with them because, as you mentioned, there are a lot of um, statistics that we want to double check, and we need to meet people on the ground. Yeah. Especially, we are talking about um, wars that have been uh, for years, like Syria and Yemen. And yeah. I, I, I don't 
uh, it's very hard to find resources and studies about what is ha really happening there. And this is actually so a one source is local journalists. Yeah, is that what exactly. You're yeah, okay. this is great. Uh, Thank and you. also uh, uh, NGOs, but we work together with with them for double show and double check. National NGOs or international NGOs or both? Both. Okay. Let's see. Did you have your hand up? Someone back here. Yes, sir. What? Who would? How would you go about doing this? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, difficult, but, uh, you know, covering, uh, I've done that in Mozambique, and um, normally you go there, but uh, when you look at the, the aid agencies, uh, the, the NGOs, uh, they are the ones that give you the, the, the lead. In fact, I, I like the lead, uh, the, the lead part of it, but you have to go beyond that. Because if, if, if they give you figures like, like what you have been saying, then you don't have, it, you don't have the complete story. So uh, the, 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 there, is, uh, there is a need that you identify uh, effective NGOs that, 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 uh, that uh, give you um, the related story on the ground. So that you know, eventually you That's you, great. you, you That's have great. A, a, a quick so. a quick Mozambique story. So one of the things I did when I was there, I think I was there. I can't remember what the heck it was. Maybe eighty five through no. Anyway, sometime a long time ago. Um, one of the things we did is we sort of set up the first I think internationally subsidized program for child soldiers rehabilitation program, and we did stuff in. Uh, the government brought a bunch of these former child soldiers together in a in a center in uh, Maputo, and they actually were using them to kind of uh, inform all the bad things that Renama was doing, which they were horrific in some ways. But to make a long story short, the government was saying they can't go home because they've killed people, et cetera, et cetera, everyone's afraid of them. And so talking to the communities, we found A, that was absolutely not true. They wanted their children back. And B, when we tried to sort of understand, because I tracked these kids for multiple years. I mean, we did sort of longitudinal research. And in trying to figure out what, because most of them turned out actually quite well. Again, not the same mental and emotional landscape. You know, it's changed forever. But at a functional level, they were doing quite well. They participated in um, community stuff much more readily than, than the average person. Their children's nutrition was better. Their kids went to school longer, et cetera. But, the thing that was illuminating for me is when you talk to communities, and I, I would argue how do you get into the communities if you're a journalist, is we were trying to figure out what, how do you know if a person's a good person? Like what does it mean to be a good person? Um, and it was, it was being a good neighbor. It was, it was if, you're, if your neighbor has a, a daughter, for example, that needs to go to the hospital and, and they don't have transportation, they don't have money, you're obliged to help that person. And that's what defines uh, uh, goodness. So I would argue, yes, international NGOs, local journalists, local organizations, but how keep trying to get into what are the community perspectives in some ways, because that's where the resilience will be. Hi. Hi, my name is Mariana. I'm from Brazil. We don't have war in Brazil, but we we have but we have so many refugees from all over the world uh, from the war. And as a journalist, um, how can we cover that, uh, knowing that these war traumas will be transferred to all generations? We know that, right? And how can we cover with these refugees there to show that and to help them? Because sometimes the silent is too bad when you don't talk about it, about these traumas. So as a journalist in Brazil, how could we help these refugees, sometimes children, which come uh, alone fr without their, right. their parents, you know? How, how could we show uh, this situation? What are your thoughts? Um, I think it is important uh, because I was thinking that we don't do that. We should do that in Brazil because I don't know, there are so many Brazilians here and I don't remember to see anything like that to, 
to talk about this trauma and how, um, how these consequences will be in this family, these families when they start a new life in a country like, like Brazil. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer your, your, your question. I mean, obviously pointing out that there's lots of refugees in, in, in Brazil and they have struggles and whatnot and maybe they've gone through some bad things and are you know, suffering uh, you know, trauma but, and whatnot, mm -hmm. but just don't write the kids off as a, as a lost generation. Again, I would say focus on resilience as much as the problem because that's where the solutions are. Where does that come from? Mm -hmm. How do you engender resilience uh, in, in, in kids? Um, I, th I think that's, if we could start emphasizing that as a, as a community, I think we would make a lot more progress. Thank you. Go All right, thank you very much. My name is Ridwan from Ghana. Um, I have two sh short questions. Uh, the first one, yesterday I asked a question about this whole concept of asset framing. Um, I would want to pick your thoughts on that, especially in covering um, children in, in, in crisis situations. And also in West Africa, we have seen the erosion of democratic trust. Uh, we've seen about six coup d'etats in the last three years. Um, what are your perspectives in terms of how we can cover the situation, that particularly on how these military takeovers are affecting um, children? Thank you. Great. I, I have to comment, too, that Ghanaians are probably amongst the best dressers in, in, in the world. So yeah, I'm just looking around. I think morning. I think you take the prize here. So, uh, so those are those are great questions. But again, as 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 I sometimes do, what do you think? Um, it's it's tricky. I don't really have a. Um, um, a position, particularly on the first one. Um, so this whole um, idea of um, asset framing is that when you are covering people, it yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be a crisis situation. You focus on their assets instead of their deficits. Because at the end of the day, the people that you are covering or the communities will not um, face their challenges with a deficit that they have, which a lot of the time we tend to focus on to make the story sensational. You know, but I'm also looking at a, way, a situation where in, in our bid to employ asset framing, we don't downplay the urgency of the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that, to me, that's brilliant. I mean, that, that is the dialectic in some ways. We have to describe the problems and the effects of the problems, but we also have to look at you know, the assets um, uh, and, 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 and how those might engender recovery, if not promoting resilience in some ways. And, and I think both sides of the story are important. But just to put the problem out there, to me, is not enough. What, what, are, the, what are the potential solutions? And you're going to find those mostly with parents, extended family members, community, and whatnot. It's not necessarily in the hands of UNICEF or Save the Children. I think we, so we have a question from Ritu and then from Noah. Yeah. Mine is more of a comment along the same vein. I, this conversation reminded me of one of the most memorable stories about any refugees that I've heard on um, our airwaves on NPR, my colleague Jason Bobian was covering uh, Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. And he, of course, he did stories about problems as did uh, other do and the challenges they were facing. But he did this beautiful short story about Rohingya kids uh, flying kites just being kids, kind of documenting a normal, ordinary, ch you know, moment of childhood in a refugee camp. And I think mix those kinds of stories are also like they do feature resilience, right? Like the kids are just trying to be kids. They've been through tough times, but they're reclaiming joy. And I think we need a mix of those stories, as, as I think both of you alluded that's to. A, that's a great example. I mean, to some extent, in the, in, in the Rohingya situation, where there's all this horrific stuff taking on, a child flying a kite seems a little bit fluffy. But if you attach it to the way that you just articulated it, making do, getting through, this is, this is also resilience in action. Kids have to play. It's as, you know, we, we work as adults. Kids, that's their work is play in a certain sense. That's, that's great. But you don't want to give the impression that everything is fine and that this is not no. a gross, yeah. Absolutely not. Um, Noah. 
Hi, I'm uh, Noah. I write for Haaretz in Israel. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. It's very helpful and interesting. Um, I wanted to ask when uh, some of the children that were abducted uh, to Gaza were returned in the deal, um, the media behavior around them was very worrying to me, and I wonder if what you think about it. So in the beginning, uh, a lot of journalists um, were saying you have to be really delicate with the children because they were traumatized, and so they interviewed just all the people around them, doctors, psychologists, parents, but not the children. And then like a week or two later, they interviewed the children as well. Um, or the children m might have been present while their parents were being interviewed. And I was kind of worried about that, and I wondered if there's a like, yes or no uh, answer to the question whether you should do it or not, or maybe it depends on the child, their age, the situation. So your question is, sh should Kids is it a good idea to things. is it a good idea to interview them or their parents and like expose information about them sometimes like medical well, again what what do you think <laughs> well i didn't do it okay. i i found it um obviously it was intriguing and interesting to to learn what happened to them there and um but i felt like it would be too dangerous to do it and i i, I okay. but i'm not like yeah. complete sure <laughs> I, I think that's, that is a really delicate area to, to get into. I mean, the last thing you want when a child comes out of a situation like that, when she was told her parents abandoned you, I mean, you know, and other, other bad things. I mean, that's the psychological torture, so to speak. Um, to, to sit down and ask her to tell her story, I think uh, there may be a time where that can happen, but, but it's not up necessarily up front, which then again kind of puts you into, well, what are the secondary sources? Um, so parents may be fair game, but I, I would say probably most, most children you would uh, want to wait. The other thing I'll just bring out um, is if you look at, uh, well, I'll, I'll say, uh, given, given my age, I've, I've uh, uh, seen a lot of different conflicts and whatnot, and I've seen one of the things that happens too with journalists is you, you, like I'm thinking specifically about Sierra Leone, for example, I'll just use that in my head as an example, where journalists came in and there, was, there were kids that had been, um, you know, sort of child soldiers and, you know, uh, played other kinds of roles. And one of the ways that journalists would try to get kids to tell their story was by drawing pictures and then asking them questions about their pictures. This is obviously something that also clinical psychologists do, for example. And what, what I think we have to be careful about is when this takes place, and say there's different kids in, in the room doing this, so you know, draw, draw a picture of your childhood or whatever, what I've noticed is it's the children who, who draw the most gruesome things that the journalists turn to to get their stories. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong about that per se, but, but kids are smart, and once they sort of see this, then they start telling gruesome stories. And in the Sierra Leone context, the kid that could tell the most gruesome story is the kid who got resettled in some ways, so it was also a means you know, to, to, to an end. So we have to just, again, be careful about what our presence and how we engage with things. Um, uh, I'm not saying don't, don't have kids draw pictures, but just be careful in terms of not just engendering sort of these false narratives. And I will add that we, our next session after lunch today is with Kate Porterfield talking um, exactly about interviewing children and, and many of these issues. So this will lead into that well. Um, Eli. Uh, hey, th thanks so much for a great talk. Um, my question is in, uh, sort of the ethics and how you think about asking uh, children and families not to look backwards but actually to look forwards for example when I've reported in uh, in Ukraine as well as uh, in Tijuana and some of the border towns which are you know under cartels functionally war zones as well and one of the things that I find myself doing often is asking these children and these families like like what um, like, what will the future look like? What do you hope for, you know, when the war is over? Like, what are you gonna eat at your barbecue at your lake house in, you know, uh, in the, you know, in the community you grew up with in Ukraine? And, um, like, uh, on the one hand, I don't wanna generate false hope or sort of dangle this, but on the other, like, it, it 
I have found that hope is uplifting that often like can really change the contours, the emotional contours of conversation. And I wonder how you think about whether that's uh, traumatizing or exploitative in terms of asking people what they hope for amidst a bleak situation that may or may not be changing. Oh, that's a great, it's a great question. I, I'm not sure I have any sort of absolute answer, but hope is good um, if, if, it, if it's not false hope. Uh, if it's if it's based to some extent in some sort of realistic potential or or, uh, or or opportunity, but hope a vision for our lives, like kids need to kind of recreate a vision for themselves when they're displaced and have gone through kind of uh, you know pretty pretty traumatic stuff. Um, and I think the extent to which interviewing can get them to think about that, I would say overall is a, is a good thing um, and not 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 a bad thing. Um, a lot of times kids will say, well, I want to be a doctor, but they're not going to get through the eighth grade. So there's a little bit of a gap between aspirations and reality and whatnot. But it's, it's a good thing to help children create a vision for themselves. Um, so overall, I would, I would say it's, uh, it's probably really helpful. Mariah? Yeah, um, I cover kids zero to eight, and I'm really trying to understand how these conflicts shape kids who are too young to maybe even talk or, or definitely too young to understand what's going on around them. Because I think there is a notion out there that if they can't understand, they're not affected. Um, how do we report on that and how do we describe what's happening to the kids um, when they might be too young to talk or to really vocalize how they're feeling? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, uh, how do you get the perspective of the child? I think with, with kids that don't verbalize, can't, can't verbalize or, or have a hard time articulating kind of what their experiences have, have, have been, I think you do have to kind of go into the developmental perspective. So what is the age and stage and what are they capable of? What is at risk? So if you're, uh, I don't know, like in, engaged at, 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 in that first thousand days of, you know, sort of gross motor skills, language, hearing, you know, that, the, the, the things that they need to kind of achieve in order to move on to so more, more so, sort of sophisticated thinking, et cetera, et cetera. What's at stake? I think you can talk about what's at stake uh, without talking to kids. Because I, I, I think in today's world, I mean, neuroscience has, has, has shown us so much about the way that, you know, healthy brains evolve and, 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 and the reverse. Uh, and it's not just research, but it's, it's, it's science. It's actually like uh, going in and with a neuroimaging, it's, like it's like an x-ray. You can literally see what is taking place in brains. You can simulate that growth uh, and whatnot. So we, we have a pretty informed science in this area. So I would, I would defer to the science and raise it as issues and questions uh, and whatnot. So I, I have, I'm gonna put our um, white man burden fellow on the spot here. <laughs> He can what, take it. Yeah. He can take it. I can tell he can take it. <laughs> All right. Here's a tough one. What is the difference between sympathy and empathy, and how does that play into what you said earlier? I'm, I, I, <laughs> I am suspicious of the idea of empathy as well because, I, yeah, I don't believe that you need to understand another person to do the right thing. And I think it's fundamentally a fantasy to believe that you can you can you can relate to or slip into the shoes as it were of somebody with whom you share nothing um and so i am a proponent of like you know you you got to be decent and you don't need to understand the other person for that but i think i i understand the context in which you're asking that question um uh, it's very difficult to replicate that value if you haven't in some way embedded yourself in that community earlier and generally, if, you're, if that involvement is sort of like a savior, then no matter what intentions you might have, it's impossible to really feel like you are, I mean, and the community can see through that. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So I do think sympathy leads you into some, uh, here, let me, let me rescue you, where empathy, in theory, should enable you to actually understand. And listening is probably the key tool in, in understanding what the community is uh, talking about. And, and, and so I, I do think fundamentally we probably should keep those two 
even though you don't believe in it. <laughs> I would argue it's, it's out there. Listening is really important. That's my point. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If anyone else has anything to add. How about our colleague? Um, I can't see your name. Uh, Sorry. In the, yeah, in the green. Any questions, comments? <laughs> you get the final word, perhaps. Okay, someone, someone, tried, someone yeah, yeah. usurped you. <laughs> yeah, mine is not a question, but I think listening from the conversation and also what is happening out there, another area where that we don't talk much is also the host communities. Because there are also children in host communities. Uh, and I was reflecting when I was growing young, you know, uh, some of the people that migrated from Mozambique, they moved to my primary school. So you come in the morning, you find the classrooms are gone. But everybody, in terms of response, they are focusing on the, those who are displaced. Yeah. They're not asking questions what's happening in the minds of these young ones. And now when I grew up in my career and also now start to working you know, with children uh, in also displaced you know, um, environments, you still see that support even just comes to the, those in the camp. But in some quarters, you find that even the host communities, they also need help. But when it comes to emotional support, I think that's another area that we should also focus because those children are also, they also need to develop to their full potential and their caregivers as well. So I think a balance defining what we mean by community. Sometimes yep. community, we mean only those in humanitarian settings, yep. but community definition should go beyond that also. Thank Brilliant, you. absolutely very important and, and something if you're covering displacement there's the displaced but there's also as this gentleman just said there's the host community and what's happening to them uh, and in some cases if you go to like Kakuma camp in Kenya for example the kids inside the camp got more support than kids in the neighboring communities and there was a big push to extend the aid out to those communities but it didn't really happen in any substantial way um, so I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you for being so frank with us about all of these issues and turning the, the mic back on, on the audience. I know you have to rush off to, um, to catch a flight. If folks want to get in touch with you later, are you um, available no, by be, email? It would be a pleasure. I, I want to thank you for putting up with me for this past hour and, and uh, best of luck. And it's not, not a hardship. I am, <laughs> I'm available. I think you have my, my email. Yeah, and, and can we distribute your sure. slides? Okay, sure, super. Absolutely. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Yeah.